Oh, I love stimulants. What? Who would shit in my coffee? Was it you? Ah, perfect time to eat a banana. What? Who stuck this feather in my banana? Was it you? Who would chew up my last 10 currency units? It was you. Today we're making Ungrateful Bird. That ring cut. All right, everybody. So if the clickbait thumbnail for this video wasn't abundantly clear, today we're gonna to be making a variation on what has to be one of the most American dishes I've come across so far, the turducken. This is a dish that combines equal parts imagination and arrogance. Traditionally, a deboned chicken stuffed inside the thoracic cavity of a deboned duck, which is then shoved inside of the slightly larger cavity of a turkey. Now, my small apartment oven is having none of that shit, so I scaled down the operation, and now it's gonna be a Cornish game hen inside of a chicken inside of a duck. So, rather than calling this thing a turducken, from now on, we shall refer to this dish as a Cornigernigan. To start this thing off, we're gonna have to debone some birds. Now, we're gonna have to perform this operation three times over the course of this dish, so we'll get some practice. Place your bird with its back towards the sky and make an incision along the spine using your knife to pull the skin away without tearing it. Once you expose the shoulder, you'll have to cut along the outside of the wishbone and then follow along the ribcage to open it up a little more. Following as close to the bones as you can. Once you get to the hindquarters, you'll see a small pearl of darker flesh, which I know as an oyster because I watched Red Dragon as a child and that opening scene is burned into my mind forever, or at least until dementia sets in. Anyway, make sure you get this piece intact, as it's not only delicious, but will connect you visually to the joint of the thigh later on. Anyway, once you've freed that little bit of gruesome cinematic history, move back to the shoulder, where if you follow the wishbone, it will take you to the joint. Cut through the ligaments and you'll see the gap between where the arm bone connects to the shoulder. Run your knife through it to sever the remaining ligaments and you're free. Then run your knife along the ribs again, pulling the skin away until you arrive back at the hip. Now just like with the shoulder, you'll have to cut through some cartilage before the joint reveals itself. Then slip your blade through the gap and sever the ligaments underneath. Once you've freed the leg, you can fully expose the rib cage by freeing the breasts from it. Take care to follow close to the cartilage so you don't mangle those tenders, which lie under the breast, but from our perspective will actually be on top. Then do the exact same thing with the other side. After that, the rib cage should be fully exposed and you can gently run your knife along the bottom to remove it taking care not to puncture the skin while also not leaving any bones or cartilage in the breast meat. I like to remove the tenders and eat them on their own just by seasoning them with some salt and searing them in some hot oil. Now we can move on to the other limbs. First, remove the bar wings by cutting slightly above where you imagine the elbow would be. This exposes the joint and you can make a clean cut right through it. All those American Civil War documentaries I watched as a kid really paid dividends with this dish. Set them aside either for frying or for a stock. Now, to remove the humerus, we invert the limb so that the knuckle is facing towards us. Cut around the top of the knuckle to sever any ligaments, taking care to retain as much meat as possible. Then, just use your blade to scrape the meat off the bone until you reach the bottom. Pull the bone out and cut it away. Repeat with the other side. Once that's done, just reinvaginate the meat back into the skin so it retains its shape and then move on to the legs. The legs are very similar to the arms except that we have two bones to remove instead of one. Start the same way by cutting below the knuckle to free the meat and sever any ligaments. And scrape down until you reach the joint. Then, just like before, find the gap and run your knife through it. 
and repeat on the other side. For the drumstick, it's a little messier because you have to cut away the cartilage that was left over from the previous bone. But just cut around it and then the knuckle, just like with all the others, and scrape it down. You can see here that there's more ligaments than with the other bones. So if you don't like eating ligaments, you'll have to take a little extra care to remove them as best you can. Then stuff the meat back into its now boneless limb casing and repeat with the other side. Now we have a beautiful boneless bird ready to be chewed and sliced without apprehension. Lastly, but extremely important, make sure you season your bird. A good rule of thumb is to add salt to whatever bite you want to enjoy. And for me, that's the whole thing. Then, do exactly what we just did with the chicken and the duck. Start with an incision along the back, mind the oysters, free up the shoulder by following the wishbone, follow the rib cage, taking care to remove the tenders with minimal mutilation, cut the rib cage off, then debone the limbs using the same method as just described. Then, lastly, season the meat. To start, we'll make a berry reduction using blackberries and blueberries. Rinse your berries and dump them in a pot with some water, then add lemon rinds, lemon juice, and then a tablespoon of sugar. Mix it up and bring it to a boil and then back it off to a simmer for 30-ish minutes until the solids have sort of mushified and then strain out that goodness, add it back into the pot and reduce it further until it thickens slightly and reaches a syrupy texture. For the mushroom reduction, you want to get some fancy dried mushrooms, add a handful of fresh thyme and around one cup of red wine and fill the rest up with water. After about 40 minutes of simmering on a low heat, strain out the solids and then put the liquid back into the pot to reduce until slightly thicker, maybe a little syrupy, just like the berry reduction we made earlier. Next, take a cup of wild rice and thoroughly rinse it in cold water. And this removes any excess starches, uh, dirt, human hair, fingernails. Put it into a pot with one cup of cold water followed by a hefty pinch of salt and bring it to a boil. Once it's boiled for a minute or two, you can take it off the heat and let it steep. After about 10 minutes, take the lid off and strain out any remaining liquid. Now this will leave you with a slightly al dente wild rice. If you want to further mushify it, keep cooking it for another five minutes. Spread your wild rice out on a plate so it'll cool faster, then dice it up until it's granular. Next, you'll need to roast a cup of hazelnuts at 350 degrees Fahrenheit from anywhere to seven to ten minutes or until the skins have darkened but are not burnt. Once they've cooled, stick them in a container and really shake it up. This helps remove the skins and then you can transfer your naked nuts into a bowl, peeling by hand any that haven't succumbed to any of the top-down pressure that you've exerted. Then chop up a large amount of mushrooms until they're pretty small, kind of like this, and saute them in a mix of olive oil and butter and add a couple of big pinches of salt. A chopped shallot or two, three to four grated cloves of garlic, a small handful of chopped fresh thyme, and three to four leaves of chopped sage. And just kind of mix it all around, add a half cup to one cup of white wine, and let it cook on a medium to high heat until the liquid has evaporated and transfer it to a bowl. Add your chopped wild rice to a mixing bowl, followed by your mushroom mixture, your mushroom stock, and a few spoonfuls of your berry reduction. And taste as you go. Mine ended up needing a little more berry reduction than I initially thought. Since we want smaller chunks of hazelnuts in our stuffing, almost kind of like taking the place of what breadcrumbs would normally do, we're gonna have to crush them in between a skillet and a saucepan. Now, when I was younger, I had not only the fortitude, but more importantly, the grip strength to bust several nuts in a row. Still got it. 
Then add all your crushed hazelnuts and mix it around. The smaller pieces will help to absorb the liquid, a task that I mentioned is normally assigned to breadcrumbs. Now it should have a texture that's coarse but not too loose. Okay, so we're going to stuff the birds and then tie them up. Before we stuff them, we have to do one final adjustment. To maximize the layering effect, we're going to butterfly each breast to create an additional sort of envelope for the stuffing and do that for each bird. Now to stuff. We fill in the canyon between the breasts and then stuff the titty envelopes we just created. Then all of the deboned limbs get stuffed as well and then you simply repeat this process with the remaining two birds. At this point, you'll be left with a pile of meat and the weight of a dawning realization that you now have to somehow tie these things up into one bigger thing. You may need another pair of hands for this, but either way, what you need to do is thread some butcher's twine through ideally a carved sewing needle, uh, but I couldn't really find that anywhere, I swear to God, like nowhere. Um, and so what I had to do is get your standard turkey pins that you can get at any like kitchen store, and then you're gonna have to give the eye uh, a slight crushing with a pair of pliers so to make sure that it's more sort of aerodynamic and duck skin friendly. Either way, this thing was basically impossible, uh, but you start at the back to close off one end and then close the front. Then make your way down the middle and tie it off. Then close the remaining opening by sewing shut the skin flaps on both sides and then tie it off at both ends. Okay, so if you're with me so far, we have all achieved one thingness. There's one extra step that I didn't do, but probably should have because the top of my cornicernifen uh, blew out and that step is trussing, basically wrapping one more layer of butcher's twine around the beast to help it hold its structural integrity. So place your creation on a sheet pan and give it a good salting. Now this will create a nice crispy salty layer on the outside, ideally like a, like a chip. I stuck mine in the oven at 350 degrees for about 40 minutes or until the outside got a nice dark color and then I lowered it to about 275 for another like two to three hours more or until the innermost part reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, if you're like me and uh, didn't trust your bird, you'll end up with something out of mid 80s Cronenberg or a, you know, a football that was kicked by a horse. Once you've let it rest for about an hour, snip off the twine at both ends. Okay, now the moment of truth. Slice it down the middle and marvel at the portrait of layered layers. Fuck. <laughs> this portrait of layered layers, right? Okay. It almost looks like a, like a close-up portrait of a fly sticking its tongue out at me. Anyway, I found out the next day that the best way to eat this thing, it's kind of like a pizza, the best way to eat this thing is to cut off a nice thick slice of now fridge temperature beast and give it a refry in its own rendered fat. Now the danger with this is some of the more al dente kernels of wild rice in the stuffing will explode in the hot oil. But just be alert and flip it over once it's got some good serious maillarding going on. And transfer it onto a plate and top with some of the reserved drippings from the pan. As a side, I fried up some oyster mushrooms in the remaining duck fat, salt them, fry them on the highest heat possible so that they brown and don't steam. All right, everyone, we've worked, we've sweat, we've bled, I've took a nap. Now it's time to eat the fruit of our loins. Let's try this. Okay, I'm ready to talk. Frying this thing, refrying a slice of this Frankenbird in its own rendered fat, 
definitely the move. It solves one of the problems, which is it makes the skin in the middle two birds get a little crispy because just in the, when it's in the middle of the turducken, it's, it's all floppy and stuff. I mean, the biggest issue with the turducken is the different cooking times for each bird. I mean, frankly, I don't even know why the duck is involved. You're better off treating the duck breasts like you would a steak and then doing the legs confit. There's definitely a heavy dose of style over substance in this one. I guess the point that I've been circling around this whole time is simply this. Fuck this shit. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Val? Okay. Do I press the red button? Uh, yes.